Welcome, everybody. This is um, a training session tailored to paid evaluators first, uh, officials that are just moving up from the registered list to the varsity list, um, and our transfers. And I see two transfers in the room tonight. Um, so we're going to run through what we expect of an evaluator. So it'll be good for the um, all the varsity officials in here to hear um, and registered officials to hear what we're teaching the observers. Um, last year, I don't think we had as good of attendance at that meeting with evaluators. Um, and then people snipe from the side of, you know, why are we teaching them that? So we want everybody to be on the same page. The evaluation system belongs to the MUA, not to the evaluations coordinator, not to the job that Michelle is doing. Um, so that's what we're here to do tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know, we had Mark Cook do this the evaluation coordinator job the last two years. Uh, Mark has a more important job now. He has more college games to referee. He's a Division I official. Didn't have time to do this job anymore. So he, um, I'll just say, resigned that position uh, a couple of months ago. We had a search for the new coordinator, and I'm happy to introduce Michelle Duncan as our new evaluations coordinator for the PNBOA. Thank you, Scott. Okay. Um, so just for those people that work full, um, Julie is the coordinator for the SWP. <coughs> and we are talking, we are sharing information, so hopefully none of our information is going to be opposite. Um, so the, the evaluations <coughs> manual should be on the PNBOA website on November 27th. Evaluations start December 1st. Uh, get your availability to Arbiter so that you can get assigned games. Uh, currently, the email for evaluations is at evaluations at pmboa.org. We're hoping to get an email straight to me. Okay, so right now that evaluations at pmboa.org goes to Scott. And um, instead of filling up that email box, if there's stuff that needs to go directly to me, just send it directly to me. Obviously, any grievances would go to the, the grievance board. For example, that might be an official treats you unprofessionally in the locker room when you go to get their evaluation. And you would definitely want to pass it on to the grievance form. So this is the same form as last year. And from when I was evaluating the officials, this is a change. And I really like this form. I think it gives evaluators a great opportunity to um, show why points are deducted in what areas. And it gives you kind of a little graph down there as to you know what each area is point valued at, and um, you know what an excellent area is, what an average is, uh, what it uh, needs to improvement. It needs to improve. <coughs> so I asked Scott um, what the average score of evaluations were last year, and he said it was 93.4. And there's about 90 officials on our varsity list. And that means that 45 officials, if we scored the same this year, is being scored 93 and above. That's a lot of people to put in seven numbers or uh, six numbers because usually 100 is not used. Um, I was at the PMBOA meeting on Saturday, and I asked the group how many people wanted to be a, a 90. And I can tell you, I think I had three people raise their hands, and that's it. Um, but as an evaluator, it is way better for your scores to be interpolated up versus interpolated down. And how they get interpolated up is you give a wide range of scores and you're willing to use the lower numbers. So um, so let me, let me just touch on one one uh, mathematical thing here. Um, does everybody in the, in the room know what an interpolation factor means? Seriously? Good, OK. Well, so real quick, for those of the, the don't, we have all the evaluators give all their 500 scores. Let's just pick a number. And the average score is a 93.4. If Owen average is a 94, we take 94 minus 93.4, and that's his interpolation factor. So every single official that he did a score on will get whatever the raw score was, plus or minus that interpolation factor. It tries to balance out. If I get all my scores from guys that are 98 raters, versus guys that are 90 raters. So you can't complain and say, well, I'm always on the bottom of the list because I got the low evaluator. Well, we try to interpolate them so everybody is equal. So that's kind of, I just want to throw that out there because I get questions on this all the time. 
So for one group to stand there and shake their head that they know what it is, this is a lot smarter group than the most of the guys I deal with. So. <laughs> Um, so, you know, the question becomes, how do you, how are you fair and how do you score? And, I mean, I would challenge each of you to come up with the answer to the, to this question. You know, what makes up your 90? What is a official who gets a score of 90, what do they look like? And there's two ways you can do it. You can, you know, say, uh, the person who receives a 90 has these characteristics or does these things, or else you can say, I'm going to have consistent point deductions for things that aren't done. And I'll give you an example that I used. Uh, when I was evaluating, if an official was a ball watcher, they got 10 points off the uh, court position in category automatically. Because my, what, in, in my parameters of what was a good official, if you couldn't watch off the ball, you were missing a lot of the game. And my expectation was the top half of the officials should be able to watch off the ball. So that was, you know, what I used. What, everybody is going to have their own evaluation system, but I would challenge you to think about, you know, what would be a point deduction so that you can be consistent. Um, after the game evaluations. We'd like you to do the sandwich approach, you know, something they did good, things to work on, and then end it with something else that they're doing well. Make sure that the evaluations are given after the game, in the locker room or some private place away from fans, coaches, players. Um, don't go into the locker room at halftime. Don't go in prior to the game. Um, make an effort to give all officials at least one point for improvement or at least input on their game. So one of the things that drives the lower half of the varsity um, list crazy is, oh, Scott, nice seeing you. How is Kelly doing? And all of a sudden, they turn to the other two people and give them a laundry list of things to do. So you can always start with an overall evaluation. Hey, you know, I thought you guys did a pretty good job today. I thought the benches were up a little bit. You know, I think you all could have worked a little bit harder on that. Um, if the person is a veteran and they've been around for a while, the expectation is that they're a leader. So the question to ask is, you know, what are they doing to help out the people that need to improve? Um, you know, are they giving the information? You know, I saw that it was a one-point ball game with a minute left to go, and you know, Scott, you've been around a long time. How come y'all didn't get together and talk about what was going to happen in the last last minute of the ball game? I mean, that to me would be an expectation, something I might ask about. Um, have written comments to support the scores. Like I said, this sheet is. Um, placed out that if you deduct scores, you should have some sort of written comment to support it. A good, 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 good is not a written comment to support deductions. So make sure you have some sort of way to improve inside that area. Um, the other thing that happens is, you know, as evaluators were assigned to games, uh, that game could be a blowout. And sometimes it's easy to take a vacation on those games because, well, gosh, there's really not anything going on. Well, I would challenge you that officials have to work very hard in blowout games, and if they're not working hard to ha create good habits, that is good information that you can put on an evaluation form. So look for a good habits in games that are blowouts. You know, just because the, the um, teams bring the ball slowly up the court does not mean that the C gets to take the night off and kind of coast into the C position. They should be going hard down to that C position. Um, so we've talked about having all the evaluators and do the, the WOA clinic, um, the concussion management, and the rule test. Right now that's up in the air, but I'm going to go through real quick if they decide to implement that, um, what, where you would go and what it would look like. Uh, the point of doing the rules test is not to scare anybody away for having bad scores. It's to get you thinking about rules and asking questions if you need them. And maybe possibly with the main page. Um, you would go to the central hub as a WOA official to get into where the testing is. And then you see where that little hand is, clinic to testing? That's where you find the site. Um, I have trouble finding that. Uh, then it will say which parts are need to be done and which parts haven't been done. So we can see this official here has completed the concussion management, but still has to do the other parts of this. Currently, you guys are not, if you're an evaluator only, you are not set up to do this. That may come later, like I said, it's still being decided on. Okay, so points and emphasis and rule changes, just so you know what they are. 
Rule changes include electronic devices, logos, sleeves, coaches in fighting, and the new tip signal. Um, so iPads are pretty prevalent this day. Coach has an iPad. They can use it to coach their team, and they can have somebody in the stands um, reporting things and taking stats. However, they are not allowed to, hey, referee, look at this play. You got it wrong. Now, that would obviously be a technical problem. Um, they still can't use meg phones or any electronic uh, communication devices on the court side. Um, use of electronic audio and video devices to review the decision of the contest for officials, but that's not allowed either. Um, they changed the rule on logos and trademarks and references. Once again, this is kind of <coughs> one of those things that I don't expect you to go out there with your ruler, but just so that you know, they can't now have a logo on their jersey. Uh, light compression sleeves have changed. Um, a lot of a lot of people, last year I think we had to have a note mm -hmm. at the scores table. We don't have to have that anymore. But um, they have to be beige, white, or a single solid, solid color. And it has to be the same for the whole team. So one kid's got a black one, one kid has a white one. They both have to have white and they both have to have black or somebody needs to take it off. Um, fighting. The head coach can enter the court to defuse a situation when a fight uh, may break out or is broken out to prevent it from escalating uh, without penalty. Assistant coaches or players who enter the court will be charged with flagrant technical fouls and disqualification. Okay. So if they step on the court, whether they participate or not, they get a technical foul. Uh, the new signal, a lot of officials have used this signal. If the ball goes from the front court to the back court, it's been established in front court and goes into the back court, and it's okay for anybody to go get it, uh, the official can use the signal of, of this and, hey, that means it's okay to go get the ball. Often to go get the ball. Um, points of emphasis this year are proper mechanics and signals, granting timeouts, guidelines to enforce illegal contact, and intentional fouls. Uh, the use of proper mechanics and signals are imperative to the success of the contest and the officiating team. The signals are a means of communicating what is happening on the floor. A uniform set of signals enhances the flow of the contest, is why they've made that a um, point of emphasis. So we have a lot of officials who work uh, different levels besides high school basketball. And I applaud those folks for doing that, and I am one of those folks. Um, but the expectation is that the people who referee high school basketball use high school basketball mechanics and signals when they referee high school basketball games. So that means one-handed numbers. Um, it means the block is like this instead of like that. Or we're raising our hand on out of bounds and then pointing a directional. Um, so just make sure that they're using the signals that they need to be using. In all high school games, we should have a preliminary signal at the spot. Um, granting timeouts, they uh, decided that, that is an area of concern. Officials must be diligent to recognize the calling of a timeout by a coach and determine that it is the appropriate time. It is suggested that coaches add a visual signal to the verbal call for timeout. And officials must know the steps of the ball, whether there is player control before granting the request. And so here are some places that obviously a timeout would not be granted because the status of the ball is unknown, right? On a pass, on a shot, uh, given to a shot. Intentional fouls. An intentional foul may be a strategic to stop the clock or create a situation that may be tactfully done for the team taking action. They may seem innocent in severity, but without any playing of the ball, it should be ruled intentional. So I think a lot of times um, officials are hesitant to call both intentional fouls and um, technical fouls, but that is one of the tools in their tool belt. And as evaluators, if you feel that, you know what, that would have been a good place for an intentional foul because it would have calmed the game down. Include those comments on your form because the officials need to know that. Sometimes you can feel that a lot more sitting in the stands than you can on the floor. And somebody coming in and giving that information is, um, is just a great thing for them. Uh, Mitch and I had a game last year, and we had this uh, kid 
who was falling out of bounds, and he threw the ball um, into, into the court, and it hit the player on the court pretty hard. And at the time, um, I was the C, and he was the official on the ball. Uh, I thought, wow, that's kind of hard, but I didn't feel strong enough to go running in, right? So I, I didn't feel like it needed to be a technical foul. But as, as I sat there, I thought, you know, maybe we should have called that a technical foul because it was a pretty intense game. They were playing hard, but it kind of had that feel that something could go out of control. And Mitch and I talked later that maybe that would have been a good place to have a technical foul, just to let everybody know we were in control of the game, we were going to protect players, we were going to make sure that both teams had a fair shot. Um, that if I was evaluating that game, that's something that I would want to write down. You know, it wasn't an absolute, but it's some place that I think sometimes people don't think about calling intentional fouls or technical fouls because they're not used to calling them or even double fouls. So as evaluators, your input is uh, instrumental in teaching people where maybe some of those tools might be a good place to call in a game. So if you see opportunities for that, make sure that you share that with the officials that you're evaluating. Okay, so guidelines to enforce illegal contact. If you haven't heard already, the NC2A has come out with a mandate that basically says, we're going to call more fouls. And one of the biggest concerns is, um, you know, is that going to trickle down to high school? And most probably it is. Um, illegal contact is a point of emphasis for high school. Um, and part of the guidelines that they're using is when contact occurs that affects rhythm, speed, balance, or quickness, then illegal contact has occurred. Okay? So if a player is dribbling down the court and he's not able to maintain the line he is dribbling because of a contact, that would interrupt his speed, it definitely would interrupt his balance, and would interrupt the rhythm, the rhythm that he had before the contact occurred. So once again, look for those type of things. Um, when illegal contact occurs, fouls must be called. So one of the challenges is, I think officials get into a lot of conversations about why we're not going to call that foul tonight. Um, and, you know, if it's illegal, it's contact, creating rough play, we need to put a whistle on it. Um, officials must not refrain from calling these types of actions that create an advantage to the opponent. Uh, so sometimes minor contact can create a huge, huge advantage. A screen that the defender is able to get around, but slows them down enough so that somebody can get a shot off, even though there wasn't a huge <coughs> contact, the person didn't go to the floor. If it stopped that defensive player from being able to uh, continue his defensive responsibilities, that absolutely would be a, a disadvantage. Um, and the illegal contact needs to be called regardless of time or score. Uh, there is a mechanics change. So it used to be that there was what we would say no long switch. So if I was the lead official and I had a rebound foul and we're going that way, I used to be able to go up, report my foul, and go back down to the baseline. That's not what happens anymore. Now I call my foul from the baseline as lead, report it to the table. I stay out as trail. The trail now goes down to lead. So basically I'm going to be running end line to end line. So one of the reasons why, in my opinion, they did that is because we weren't getting ourselves from the baseline to the table and reporting the foul accurately enough because we were too much of a hurry to get back down there. And a lot of times, I like to say we were leaving the scene of the crime to go report a foul and before the partner can get down there. So I think now you leave, the other person comes, and now you're right in front of the table and ready to just go referee the play. So. That's my editorial comment. Um, there is a new logo for the PMBOA, and some people have that uh, patch on their jackets. Um, no deduction for that. We can have different jackets out there with different patches, and everything's okay, just so that you know. Um, and the WOA patch, that's required for all school games. So if you're evaluating that somebody doesn't have a WOA patch, that's what it designates that, you know, we're uh, refereeing high school basketball in the state of Washington, so or school basketball in the state of Washington, so make sure they have those patches on. In an effort to get on the same page, what I would like to do is I'd like to send all the evaluators an invite to Dropbox. Um, at the PMBOA meeting on Saturday, Joe Thompson talks about, he's got about a 15-minute video where he talks about illegal contact and some of the challenges we're going to have each year. And 
because it's 15 minutes long, I didn't want to spend the time uh, doing it tonight. But I do want to make that available to all of you. And so I'd like to put it in Dropbox so that you can watch it at your leisure. I think it's good information. And I think it's good for you guys to know what the uh, members are being told so that you can look for that. Um, and so what I'd like to do is uh, send that out. You're able to go to the link, and then you can just watch it on YouTube yourself. Um, what I'd like to do during the year is if there are play clips to share, I'd like to be able to share those with you through Dropbox also. So I just wanted to kind of give you a heads up that you're going to get an invitation. Um, obviously, we have an army of uh, volunteers, not recruits here, so it will be up to you to take responsibility and, and learn if you like. Um, two more meetings. There'll be one in January, kind of mid-season to check and see if we're all on the same page and hopefully get all, all on the same page. And in March, we'll have a year-end wrap-up. So I came to the party a little bit late. I've not had this position before, and I only got it about 10 days ago. Um, so I don't have all the information of what's occurred the last couple of years. Uh, but that's kind of what we're going to do in the future. Uh, before we go to closing the marks, I've got a couple play clips to show you. I forgot my pointer, so I apologize for that. Um, but I, so I will apologize right now. These play clips are all women's basketball. I don't have any um, um, PMB away games currently in my in things that I clipped. But I think that there are some things that happen pretty consistently in um, all of basketball that we can talk about and um, look at. Um, okay, so one of the things that happens so in this clip, you know, the C's got really a good position, and then this person takes themselves out of it, and it'll play again. Here he's free throw line extended, and he's looking across exactly what he's supposed to look at. Uh, when the instead of staying where he was, that great look through, he steps up and takes himself right into stack. And then on top of that, as the ball starts to drive towards the basket, he has it back all the way in, and kind of the same view as the as the um, as the trail. So he forced the rotation, not he didn't allow the rotation to come to him. So in this play, I would have liked to see to stay right where he is here, not to move up and to wait for the lead to initiate the rotation. Everybody see that? Like I said, I apologize. I did not bring my pointer today. Um, yeah. you want, can we do that? Yeah. We're going to turn the lights down a little bit. Maybe that'll okay. help. If we, can, if we can figure it out. Oh, it might be over. Halsey, can you go? Jeff, can you go somewhere? Oh, oh that's taking okay. the screen up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so in this one, it's all connected. It's all connected. It's okay. 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 So how many people in this room think that one official can handle two people? Because there's eight others down, down the court. But we look at our C official over there, and look at his head. So what do we really have here? We have two officials on two people, and eight people that one official is taking care of. Um, so in this clip, um, the C has basically anticipated that, oh, the ball's going to come to my side. I think I'll just be ready for it and be lazy. <coughs> official should have gotten down the free throw line extended with all eight players inside the three-point arc. And then if he needs to come back and accept this play instead of accepting it like he does. So we'll play this one through twice just so that you see it. That's at Northwest Nazarene. Once again, this is not, well, there's a light press on, but once they get the ball on, the press completely goes away. I would really like to see this official hustle down the free throw line extended instead of hanging back and refereeing. Uh, back with the trail. I think the trail can handle that one. 
Michelle, uh, can I ask a question real quick? Uh, Absolutely. As, uh, if you're evaluating, at what what are you doing at this point in your evaluation on your sheet or whatever? Mm -hmm. Are you just taking notes at this point and then you're going to score everything? Are we, am I getting ahead of what we're No, no, no. no that's that's good question. question. Yeah. Um, what I would do is I would write the comments on a separate sheet. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times what I do when I evaluate is I take my sheet like this and I put it in thirds so that I can hit all officials at one time mm -hmm. and then figure out which boxes they go in. Okay. Um, yeah. Like I said, for me, that's easier. I've tried to do three sheets and I find that I'm running through paper and all of a sudden I put this comment, oh darn, that wasn't Mike's comment, yeah. that was supposed to be Jim's comment, and now I'm scratching things out. So for me personally, what I like to do is I like to take notes. And what I normally do is at halftime, um, I, I try to get those notes onto the paper and see how I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, I, I think all of us come with an idea of what we think a great official is and what we think a not so great official is. And, um, you know, remember to evaluate on that game. But the other thing is if you have two comments for one official and 20 for another, I need to watch the official with two comments a little bit more so I can come up with some comments. Because I think everybody can, there's value with everybody in having comments in their game. And they don't have to be negative. They could be things that do better. You know, you can do better. Um, I talked about the uh, uh, time out with a minute to go. Like I said, I want the veterans to get that information of this would have been a great time to bring your crew together. Should there be a point deduction for that? I don't know, but it's definitely something they could improve on. Um, so I, like I said, I would really uh, work to have com comments for all officials, not just good, good, good. And to really try to think of things are, you know, were tone setting calls made? And if a tone setting call was made, did the other, um, did the rest of the crew join in? And if not, did you guys talk about that at the time? Did you talk about that at halftime? I mean, that is a, that's a great veteran veteran question. Um, hey, you know, I, I noticed that your partner was taking a lot of heat from the coach. Did you guys talk about that? Did you think about, you know, maybe stepping in and giving a technical foul? Um, you know, did you ask him, you know, how he felt about it? Because there's a lot of times that young officials are in situations they just don't know what to do. So they do nothing. And that's really when I think we need our veterans sharing information and saying, hey, you know what, I think we could have done this better. See, wow, they're, they're both on the play. So this is clearly in the C's area. It's their play. But after the pass, I want you to see what happens. And then we'll talk about whose call it was. So the C goes with the ball, right? And you see this contact over here on the sideline? Mm -hmm. okay, we'll, we'll run it through again. I'll watch it. It'll, it'll loop back through. Okay, so I am not going to say whether this is a foul or not. If this was me evaluating this play, and this is the reason I clipped it, is my question to the C would be, you know, there was some contact after the foul, and you're going so quick with the ball, I don't know if you have that play. I don't know if you're seeing the finish of it. Um, so my, my concern is that the C just leaves this way too quick, because where the contact occurs, who else can get that? So as an evaluator, that's something that you can see in the stands that all three of these officials have no idea that it happened. Okay? So that, that might be a good thing to notice. That, you know, are you moving so quickly with the ball that you're missing the end of what happens? We see this type of thing happen 
when we have a, a outside shooter by the three-point line. You know, does the official see them all the way down to the ground? So I know for me personally, when I have a three-point shooter, I want to say up, down, <coughs> defense. Find the defense that's going out, right? Because I need to know if they're coming out or staying in. Rebound. Those are the four things that I need to do on that shot. And if they're not, if people aren't doing those four things, you know what? We're not taking care of the game. Okay, this one here. We'll run it through one more time. Okay, ball is clearly on the seaside. Does everybody agree with that? Mm -hmm. the line yeah. standing over on the seaside. Fran's still on the ball, right? right. Has the sea picked up the ball? How many people think the C's picked up the ball? Yeah, I think the C's picked up the ball too. So my comment on this one is, as C, you need to make sure that your partner is able to recognize that you picked up the ball. Because there's no movement whatsoever from the C, even in the next couple frames, you know, when, when is that C picking it up? I'm pretty sure they've got it. And there's, we don't have a really competitive matchup, right? The defense is about eight feet away. But the trail doesn't know that, hey, I need to go down and get off this because they're unclear as to whether the C's picked it up or not. Okay? So in this in this crew working, that's what I would notice on this play. So how would you remedy that? Uh, well, how I would remedy it on an evaluation form is if you are picking up the ball, you need, you need to be clear when you pick up the ball. Whether it is a head movement, a body movement, an R, a fake count, some people will use that. It doesn't matter what you use, as long as you can communicate with uh, your partner that you have picked that up. And, th and that's something that those officials should have talked about in pregame. Hopefully. Hopefully they've talked about it. Otherwise, you're going to have that situation. OK, on this play here, we have got a really quick rotation by the league in transition. So the ball's coming up the seaside line, and wow, look at that lead go straight across the, the paint. Everybody see that? Okay, so here's my challenge. My challenge with this play is, and in, in this scenario, there's not a whole lot going on. Okay, but we talk about good habits. You know, blog game, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about good habits. What kind of triangle do we have right now? It's really a crummy triangle. You don't. Okay. I mean, basically, the T can be no help. If the person on the low block, there's two plus players down there, and something uh, happened that wasn't good, like an elbow, <coughs> that is a long way for him to go, and I don't know if he really has it. I mean, looking at his head, he's still kind of over with the ball anyway. But when officials immediately rotate over, they leave the crew in kind of a bad position. Okay, and that's just what this clip is showing you is that um, a quick rotation is great, but make sure that all officials could be involved in the play. And the trails, a trail call right now, down inside, on the back side, would pretty much be unbelievable. Okay. Okay, and this one here, so this is, this is a good one. You know, what, what do you give your veterans? You know, I'm going to give them something. So on, on this play, we'll notice that we have myself, slow-mo one, over here. You see the leads come over, right? And I got to tell you, on a good day, I'm not quick. And I'm starting out about 10 feet behind. <laughs> there is just no way in holy heck I'm going to make it. But luckily for us, the lead realizes that you know the other person was able to get up there and adjust. So one of the things that makes us a better officiating crew is for A, the lead to have awareness, you know, what's gone out with the two officials, have they rotated, and if they come up more the center of the floor, if you have two people bust into the baseline, then they have the opportunity to go to either side. A lot of times, as, uh, as uh, new leads, we'll still see people hug the wrong side line, okay? So this one's 
got all sorts of problems. We'll watch it twice first before I talk about it. And I can't get rid of the stuff in it, so. Okay, so our first challenge is the ball stops high over in the seas area, really, uh, you know, really hot. So does the sea go up and pick that up, no. or does the trail stay with it, or do we have double coverage? There's a lot of people out there. Okay. Yeah. So so right now, you know, uh, the two partners have to decide. So who's going to get that play? Okay. So right now the lead's still on it, but it's clearly over in the seas area. That's okay. So you see the. the C come up to help. So they have turned their body towards it, taken a couple steps up. Hey, I've got this play partner. And the trail kind of still hangs out as trail instead of compressing. Okay, now Lee's not helping us out because we see the ball's over on the C side. We've got some players over there, um, and the lead's just kind of hanging out. Okay, so they have to help facilitate a rotation here. And the trail even if the lead's not going to rotate, should compress a little bit. So I'd like to see them six steps down about volleyball line, that line that goes across the court, okay? Because the C has now got this play up top. So the C assumes here that there's going to be a rotation, which, as we see the lead still down there on the baseline, hasn't happened. Wow. I don't know whether I realized that rotation hadn't happened or not, but... The next thing I do is, oh, on the shot, bail out, right? Didn't stay in there for the rebounding. So that would have been a better thing to do. And since the lead never came across, I tried to force a rotation. And look, once again, look at our triangle. We've got two trails and no C. And on top of that, the C's bailing out. We really need our C's to stay in there. So this kind of shows you a play where it goes from bad to worse. You know, we had a tough situation that almost trapped in the seas area real high up by the, by the mid-court line is a tough situation to referee. And as a crew, we really put all of ourselves in a bad position on this play. And everybody had responsibility. The lead could have helped facilitate a rotation. The trail could have compressed uh, when, this, when it went over to the sea side as soon as it kind of broke up a little bit. So there's some different things that could have been done. all the time in high school officiating. So we are focusing on the lead on this clutch. We'll run it through twice. Okay, so here's my challenge with this clip. Western. Okay, so what do we think the lead's looking at? Had a guess. Ball. I, mean, I think the lead's looking at the ball. Yeah. So my question would be that these two players here, that is the trouble spot. I'd rather see the lead looking over at the at the trouble spot because I know that whoever is C running down there have the two players, the defensive person and the person with the ball. The other challenge I have is when this official goes across, they are immediately picking up everything on their side of the key. Okay? Once again, this official's focus is out, oops, ah, sorry, out here to his new responsibilities instead of taking care of his old stuff. And his old stuff in this play with all the players um, on that side of the key would be to look up for the competitive matchup that is not uh, with the ball. Okay? So his focus should be on those two players out by the three-point line, but not 100% of his focus. Right? So he needs to referee back through as he's going across.
So in this clip, we see the lead come across the paint two times in a very short period of time. Correctly. High school basketball, I'd like to see more of that. Okay, so in the beginning of the clip, ball is on the C sideline, right? So it looks like they're setting their play up on the side. And a large percentage of the players are over there. We've got six players on that side. We have the two at the top of the key. That means there's two over on the other side. Okay, good time for rotation. We want to be in position to referee the play before the ball gets there. So we see the lead go flying across. Okay? We're good with that, right? The ball gets pulled back out. But we still have a lot of players on the lead sideline, so I'm still good with that lead positioning. Now we see the post move to the low block. And we see the lead go across to get in position to referee the play. The lead is coming across. You see how they're hustling to get there? Because we would like them there and standing so that they can see how that post receives the ball in illegal contact. <coughs> If they saunter across, they're going to be in the R when the post receives the ball. <clears throat> Only two people over on the C sideline in that shot is taken. That is a great play for the C to watch because that's all they have. And that's one of those ones where um, everybody's heard whistle tempo. If the lead has a whistle on this, it needs to be contact. Breath, then a whistle. Because we want to give our C. They didn't have anything else to referee. We want to give them opportunity to call that. Okay. So um, double whistles are good if they're in the right areas. The key, right area. Handoff between T and C, a lot of times the right area. Okay. You know, maybe they need to work on their handoffs a little bit more. Okay. So. That's all I've got. I just had a couple of quick clips to get you guys thinking about basketball. Any questions, comments, concerns before we wrap up? Yeah, probably. Okay. Um, when we're evaluating for the special for the new varsity guys while we wait in the JV games, when we have referees who don't want to be evaluated, don't want to be part of the process, can you give us a uh, best way to handle that? Um, so to give you some background on why he's asking this question, we have two or three JV referees that don't come in the locker room after the game. They grab their stuff at table side and they're gone. Um, so you've been there an hour and a half of your own time to evaluate that game, but they don't want to hear your comments. So still do an evaluation on that official, turn it in to the system. They're not going to be there to hand, you know, to hand it to, okay? So, unfortunately, the logistics is such as we can't schedule those two or three guys or gals on every game to work together that don't want the evaluations and let us know ahead of time so we don't have to get there to, do those, to evaluate those games. So that situation is getting fewer and far between. So just do the score and turn it in as one of your evaluations. I don't know how else to answer that. Uh, oh, actually, I'm going to make a comment on that. Yeah. So, uh, for the people that are varsity officials evaluating JV officials, um, remind yourself when you're there and you get that reaction that there are uh, little nuggets and pearls in the game that you're watching that you can learn and put in your own game. So, you know, yeah, the person didn't want the evaluation, maybe they were even a jerk about it. But, you know, I was looking at how they presented their push signal, and that looked really weak. I wonder what my push signal looks like. Um, the whole, the great thing about teaching is you look at your own game and you have to figure out what you do and do you like what you do and what you can do to make it better. You know, look at how they're communicating with their partners. Do they look like they're on the same page? How are they communicating with the benches, with the, um, with the, with the coaches, players on the bench, players on the floor? Can you identify the trouble spots out there? You know, maybe I talked earlier about the place that an intentional foul or technical foul might be a good place. You know, those are all things you can bring to your game. 
So it's not valueless, the fact that the person doesn't want to comment. So remember that. And you know, there are people out there that don't want that. And just say, you know what, I'm going to get the stuff that I can get from this. And if you want my comments, great. Otherwise, it's OK. But I'm in a situation. I can get off the JV game, but I have to beat feet to get to work by 8, 8.30 at my job up in Bothell. So sometimes I don't have a lot of time to stick around and bag it. Back. I, I don't mind the comments, you know, but just don't give me a so, mark down me. Oh, okay, we so, stick around so go to work part of this avocation we're in yeah. comes down to communication. Scott, I have to leave. I'd love to hear your comments. Can you send them to me in an email later? But I got to get to my job. Okay. okay. We've just had a communication. My impression isn't you don't care, so screw you. Okay. Yeah. We've communicated. Okay. Does that help? I, yeah. I may be the only guy that works at eight o'clock sometimes or eight thirty. Well, we have a lot of people that say, "Hey, it's my wedding anniversary tonight. Um, I'd love to stay, watch the game, and get my feedback." But however, I got to get going. Perfect. We've communicated. Um, I got to go work rec ball for Leslie tonight. Okay, we've communicated. It's the ones that he's asking about that just flat don't give a rip about getting feedback. They're just there to collect their paycheck and go home. Okay. Okay. Jeff. Um, in regards to that, have you guys ever thought of somehow doing a thing at the you know beginning of the season with enough with enough advance saying, hey, this is just an open so to speak invitation that if anybody that is on the registered list does that just does not want to get evaluated, just put it out there. And if you're okay with saying, hey, I don't want any evaluations starting at the beginning of the season, that way they know that that's that. They don't have to get evaluated. And then when people go to the game after that they're officiating, that not necessarily that they don't have to evaluate, but they know that, hey, this person doesn't want an evaluation. So at that point, it's, you know, it's kind of your choice whether, so, hey, you want to write some stuff down. So, so we not. tried that? that logistically to try to schedule the two guys or two gals that are in that same boat because if you're working with somebody that doesn't care, I still gotta come to you. It's just it's it's we've tried it in the past. We just haven't been able to make it work. Well I, I just mean so the varsity officials that are coming to that game, if there's two officials on a JV just if so there's they know, two. hey, there's one person here, this person he does not want to get right. evaluated. Okay, so we can just do the do it for the one, right. and that way we know up front. Is that well, we still got but we still got to show up and go do that game. Right. We're also required to put numbers in regarding X number of evaluations as well. So right. in fairness right. to the officials right. that show up. Oh, okay. So okay. that makes sense. So that's been a long problem that we're not going to probably solve in the near future. But we what we have talked about it in great length. <coughs> So, um, actually, that situation came up last year uh, with the board. And keep one thing in mind, it's whether you want to be evaluated or not as an association, we have a certain level of expectations that we have to do. I don't care if you don't want to get evaluated, but when you're out there and you put the stripes on, you represent the PMBA way, you're an official to officiate the basketball game of the uh, student athletes who are out there playing. So there's a level of expectation. And what Scott said earlier, we don't have too many of those people because what happens is the board doesn't get rid of them, the veteran doesn't get rid of them, the association as a whole says, apparently this is not important to you, so we really would ask you to have other options. I mean, it was a, it was a huge problem in years past, but now more and more, if people come into this association and understand there's a level of expectation that everyone has. And it doesn't have to be a veteran and a newer person. It's it's two young guys. I mean, I, I want to make it to the varsity list. Or I want to make it to the JV because I'm tired of doing freshman sophomore games. Okay, you may not want to get evaluated, but if you're on this game with me, I expect you to do your job so I can do mine. If you choose not to advance, that's on you. But you're here with me, and we're going to work this together. And the system eventually will weed people out. It's, it's not, a, it's Cause, not anything. Because remember, we don't have to offer a service contract every year exactly. to somebody. And to go to Dave's point, we're still required to give our X percent of the valuations that are also going to move up or whatever. So, um, be, before we before we all go tonight, I want to grab the new JV or the new varsity officials and the transfers and have a 15-minute conversation with you all um, before you leave tonight. Just so.
set that uh, expectation. One more question. Yep. Comment, you know, Henry, if we run across the same guy maybe two or three times, should we evaluate him every single time, or just can we yes. do one? Every time. <clears throat> every time. And if there's a concern about that, then that's where I get involved. Okay. So just so the uh, paid evaluators hear this, your main communication um, is with Michelle. And once we set up that email, that will go directly to Michelle. Because I'm trying, as an evaluations uh, board member, um, I want to keep as far away from dealing with the evaluators as I can because I'm still getting evaluated by these guys. Okay? Um, so I don't see scores. Uh, if you have a major concern with a policy, or a policy or something, then I get involved. But otherwise, you're going to deal directly with Michelle. Can we PDF these and send them to you, or do you want the hard copies? Yes, I'm okay with PDF. Or you I'm, well, I'm Can they scan them? Scan them and send them, or do they have to send them hard copies? Let me let me get back to you on that. I don't I don't know what they did. Scans easier. I scan my all, all my master. And and just turn them in. Yeah. Send okay. Them directly. So the answer is yes. Do it. Yes, you may scan them and send them. Uh, we didn't talk about two man mechanics at all, and some of these guys are just. Of our so I really do evaluate a evaluated two man mechanics. Are you expecting the JV officials to to uh, go over to the strong side and put two guys over there a lot? Not a, not so, a lot. So let me, let me answer that real simply. <laughs> okay, when the play dictates, I'd expect you to go referee where you can get position to make the right okay. call. Right. Does that help? Because I saw a lot of JV games last year where that official never went strong side once. Because they were told not to go ever go across the paint. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know who the heck would have taught, taught that. So my, my answer is go where you can see the play. Okay. So I'm also going to make a comment. Okay, go ahead. Um, so the varsity officials, do, do evaluators also evaluate two-person games? We, we were going to try to incorporate that this year, where the paid evaluators were going to go watch our JV games. Uh, it doesn't look like that's going to happen for this season. So we do have a So most side. of the yes. folks that are going to be evaluating the JV officials are the varsity officials that have done uh, two-person mechanics not too long ago. Right, right. And a lot of them still work rec ball, which is all two-person mechanics. Um, they're going to have different opinions. They're going to give you different information. And uh, realize if you're new to evaluating JV officials, that there are some times that you are going to give those officials information that contradicts what they heard the night before. Be prepared to be asked, why are you telling me that? So as a new person evaluating JV officials, be prepared to explain to people, why would you go strong side? Why, why wouldn't you go strong side? So when you write a comment down, you might have to explain it, so make sure you know the answer, you know, the why of, of you telling somebody to do something. David? In the past, new varsity officials evaluating before the new year, those don't count. Correct? No. They count towards the number you have to have for the year, but they don't count for that JV official. Yes. That needs to be communicated to that JV official so they don't expect it in their score. What, what did you just say? Okay. In December, yeah. when the new varsity officials are evaluating, those don't count. Not, not, that, that's not true. That's not true? That's not true. You sure? I'm it's positive. Positive. That's when evaluation started on December. Evaluation started on December 2nd. That's why I'm going to have the conversation I'm going to have with these. Okay, maybe tonight. it's different than SOWB. Yeah. Well, it could because be. The, the new RST officials, their evaluations they, they don't keep count in, until the keep, first of the year. Keep in mind, this is the PNBOA. Okay. It's never been true. That's not that I remember. No, I've, I've never seen that in the PNBOA. Okay. I thought the girls started December 2nd, too. So do we. David. Paid about it. David, David. Yes, yes. writing the evaluations. You I think Mitch and then I wrote So that 90 is being an average official, the discussion we had, is that kind of the direction for both the uh, paid evaluators and the varsity evaluators evaluating JV is we want an average official to be in that ballpark of, of 90 this year? We're trying to push it down to around that. Okay, so we're going from 93, 94 range as the average, and we want it to be down in the, we, we the 90 more, range. We want more varying, variance. Okay. Like Michelle said, we don't, want, we don't want to cram 45 people in a six-point box. Okay. 
but we can tell every single paid evaluator that. And and I've been in the group, this group, a couple years, and we try uh, start at 100 and go down, start at a 90 and go up. Um, every evaluator is going to have their own way to go out and evaluate a game that have been doing it for a while. Um, the brand new guys, brand new evaluators, and we have like three or four of them this year. Um, we have a lot better chance of them doing them have an average of 90 um, than we do of the the guys that have been doing it for a long time. That's just a that's just a fact. Okay, we're shooting to lower the average to about a 90, and we'll see how it turns out when we calculate all these out in April. That's all I can, that's all I can say. The larger range gives a truer picture of who your beneficials are. Um, it does not make a uh, it does not make a score of an 88 drop somebody all the way down to the bottom. Um, and I don't know if anybody has noticed in the past that I mean there's people that drop are that drop and raise 40 positions in a year. And I mean that that's just huge movement. Um, granted, there are some people that really work harder in their game and improve that much, but wow, that's just some, some <coughs> huge movement um, for officials. And I'll tell you right now, we could grab 10 people off the street and have them walk, look at 10 officials, and here's what would happen. They know nothing about officiating. Those 10 people could agree on who the top two officials were, guaranteed. And they could also agree on the bottom two officials without any problem. All those people in the middle, they're going to have way different opinions. And that's what happens to us, is most of us, evaluators, officials, we can all agree who the top people are, and we can all agree who the bottom people are. But all those people in the middle, we all have different opinions of them. And those are the people that get hurt by those really um, short, you know, really short scores when we really uh, don't have very much disparity between officials. Scott, anything else? I'm good. Okay. Anybody else have any? Yeah, I, I, got, one, I got one thing that it's, it's come up a lot, and this is more of an administrative thing, especially to us varsity guys, and I'm like number one on the list, and I'm not alone, I know that, because I have some of your sheets to prove it, but one of the things that is really crucial, I think, is, is information. I think Michelle uh, was mentioning all through the presentation. So when you write something down, make sure somebody can read it, I mean, it, it, may, it may seem like a very insignificant thing, but the, if you can't read the information, it's really of no value. And then one of the things that we've discussed more than a few times is, okay, if I can't read what you wrote, I'm going to look at the score you gave me and assume what you wrote was bad. So I think the point Michelle made earlier about comments justifying the score, so even if I don't like the score, I still benefit from a comment. Okay, you don't get to the baseline on time or you... Your, your signals need some improvement, but if I can if I can understand and read that, and we all have different handwriting, like I said, I'm number one on the list. I mean, I have a true doctor's handwriting, so I, that's one of the things I need to, to improve on. But just just make sure people can read the information you write. And I think Michelle, what you mentioned about the threes, because I know I've done that. You kind of try to do four or five sheets at one time, and it's like it's like writing in Mandarin Chinese. It's like I don't know what the hell I wrote, so. Just so a little so one one other thing to just kind of piggyback on that. Um, the, the reason why we do an evaluation system is pretty obvious that we have to put out a rank order at the end of the year, and that's what this system does. But it also, we want to be able to learn and we want to be able to teach. So along with putting your score, we want to make sure that every time you go evaluate an official, that you're trying to help them get better. Okay, so we keep that in mind why we're doing this. The number is what is the end all, but we're still there. We're still there to help. And if you, like Michelle said, if you just write good, 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 98, well, it really haven't helped me get to be a better official, or help my partners or whomever to be a better, a better. So that's all we have. I appreciate everybody's time. I know it's a pain to come out on a rainy, dark night, but um, it's good that we all can get on the same page and do this. And I thank um, the evaluators for being here. Um, Ron, I'd like to talk to you for just a couple seconds after work tonight because um, you're the new guy. So everybody else can uh, be dismissed. And I appreciate you guys coming. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle.